Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all down here at Grassroots. A ton of smiling faces. Appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your Saturday to come down here and join us. I know it was a little hard for me to get out of bed this morning. That rain, that rain was coming down. We got a little bit of liquid sunshine. This has been a crazy week. We had 80, 80 degree and then down back down to 40, but that's kind of our our traditional springtime weather around here. But so we got Mr. Gerald Stevens back with us again today. We're going to talk about landscape design, one of my favorite things to talk about because I studied landscape design years and years ago. And landscape design is really, it's really interesting and it's critical to planning out your garden. And the thing I loved about it most was every customer and every yard is always different. But I love to get to know the customers to find out what they were hoping to accomplish out of their yard slash garden. It's just a ton, a ton of fun. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Gerald here and uh, let him tell us all about it. Buddy, it's all yours. Oh, and Does everybody have one of these? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah we put them right up front soon as you come in the door. And all right. as, as always, Miss Connie's got her famous popcorn back there. We got some donuts and coffee. So y'all help yourselves and enjoy it. It's all yours, buddy. A guy told me yesterday, it was such a beautiful day. He said, well, this makes you appreciate the morning. And I said, you are right. It definitely does. Um, and one of the most important things, it's the first thing on the list here, um, is where is the sun? And um, when I was, you know, I've never had any formal training in landscape design, but I love it and I was kind of falling into it. But um, people would come into old retail when I was a kid and uh, bring in a, a blueprint and photographs. I was just petrified because I I knew I couldn't I didn't know why but I couldn't help them with a design. I mean I could give them basics across the front, you know, a row box with something like that, you know, and something big on the corners, and um, but I couldn't give any feel to it. And, but I didn't know that's what it was. Well, the main thing about it and is. I have to see where the sun is. I cannot design a yard unless I know where the sun is coming from. Well, it's probably 50% of the people in this world are directionally challenged. <laughs> and you know who you are probably. And I married one, and I didn't I see everybody in my family was seven of us. And all seven of us, my mother, father, and five kids, we were, none of us were directionally challenged. And if you're not, if you're directionally challenged, you don't understand this, but um, you know where you are kind of at all times from, from the sun, you know, north, south, east, and west. Well, people would come into the nursery and hand me a set of blueprints and photographs and say, well, uh, can you help me with this? And I said, well, let me see. I said, well, where is the sun? And the wife will say, well, it comes up over there in the morning. No, he said, no, it comes up over there. So I knew we had trouble <laughs> right off the bat. <laughs> Both of them directly challenged. But that's one of the most important aspects of it. Uh, and it's funny, even on an oak-cast day, normally I still know where I am, you know. But that is very important. Uh, if nothing else gives you a compass, and, uh, and find out where north, south, east, and west is. People say, well, the sun goes like this, and I said, no, it goes like this. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it does go in the, in the wintertime. Uh, it is gonna be lower, uh, and then in the summer, it's gonna be higher. Uh, June 20th is at its height, is that right? I think it is. That's when the first day of summer. But anyway, um, that is so very important in a yard is how much sun or shade it is. Um, and so we'll jump right in on grasses and uh, everybody wants grass everywhere. And I'm going, no, no, no. You can make your yard look so much better if you have areas of grass. But then most landscape designers, they will design all these beds in their yard, kidney shape, round, and all these kind of odd shapes and everything. 
and then they'll just let grass fill in the cracks. Well, I like to, and each designer develops his own little quirks, and one of my quirks is I like to design my grass first. And I'll even go into an old yard, and you'll see, um, you know, trees everywhere, and grass kind of fading in and out under the trees and everything. And so I want to define that grass so that the grass looks crisp and, and defined, and then your beds look crisp and defined. And so what I kind of suggest is we all know how, how a, a golf course green looks from the sky. And that's, that's comfortable, it's pretty, it's got curves, real nice and all. And then it, um, it doesn't have a tree in the middle with a circle around it. Either. And um, that's what most people want to do. Put a tree right in the middle of the yard and put a circle around it. And it drives me crazy. Um, first of all, a tree, 90%, um, 95% of the roots are within six inches of the top of the ground. You know, we think, oh, they go deep. And they'll say, well, this tree just has roots everywhere. You know, I can't. Um, I can't grow anything under. Well, the tree's trying to tell you, tell you something there. Uh, but anyway, um, we need to select a grass. My favorite grass is one of the zorgias, and there are a lot of varieties out there. Uh, there are a lot of new varieties, and uh, there are some of the old ones. The oldest variety we have is Emerald Zorgia, and it is probably the best of all of them. Uh, it's it's real stiff, it's real fine bladed, and it will grow in almost darkness. But now, don't try that. <laughs> but uh, I've got one landscaper, he, can, he said I may grow it dark. And uh, if he fertilizes it enough and cares for it enough. But um, Amazor's is probably the most disease resistant insect. I don't think any insects will grow. Um, mold crickets might, but I doubt it. But um, it's just tough grass, and it looks very much like Bermuda grass. It's hard to tell the two apart. And what I tell people, I said, all right, if you don't know what it is, have you ever laid on on it in, on your back on it in the, with a t-shirt on, and is it prickly? They said, yeah. I said, well, you got you got that absorption, because <laughs> Bermuda is real soft. And, uh, but Emerald's Orange is, is a little stiff, but it's beautiful though. But um, em, the thing about Emerald is it'll take a lot of shade. And when I say a lot of shade, it's not going to take that much. You see, I say three or four hours of full sun a day, um, whereas Bermuda takes a lot more, a whole lot more. Probably takes more than I even suggest there, uh, five, uh, four to six. But, um, uh, we don't want to just have shade, I mean, have grass everywhere. You want it to shade, and it's kind of like, I don't want to, like a carpet in a way, and you have the beds around it, and you can make it look a whole lot better than having, uh, having a little bit of grass that looks good, rather than having a lot of grass, and none of it looks great, except some maybe in the full sun or something like that. And it's easier to mow when you got it, you know, where you got it. It doesn't fade in and out under the trees. And, um, <clears throat> so then um, Bermuda is what you see in most of the yards that have been put in commercially. And um, it takes the most sun of all. And Bermuda needs mowing. To really get it to do good, it needs mowing twice a week. If you mow it once a week for two days or three days, it's going to look scalped. If you mow it twice a week, you don't have to bag it. And you can, it, it, in other words, you probably, you, if you mow it twice a week rather than once a week and bagging it, you're probably going to take less time. So um, Bermuda's not bad if you do it like that, but if you have to bag it and all that, and then it's scalped looking. It's not worth it for me. Uh, and it, it needs that constant mowing. It's a golf course grass. Don't ever try 
seeding Bermuda. You will be very disappointed, and next year you won't have it because it won't make it through the winter. The seed we sell now, well, we've always sold, is actually uh, grown in Arizona, more of a tropical, not tropical, but warmer climate, and it won't take our cold here, and you're gonna lose it. Uh, so don't try to grow the you then. Okay, centipede. That used to be at least 75% of our yards, uh, but we don't see it as much as that anymore. We probably have it's probably about 30% of our yards now. Um, for years, we fought dieback in, in centipede. We didn't know what it was. Clemson, University of Georgia, Auburn, North Carolina State, all were trying to figure it out. For the first 10 years, we saw more nemagon for nematodes in centipede than you can take a stick at. And that stuff, y'all, is dangerous. It was bad. I can't believe we could sell it. You think chlorinate's bad? It was really bad. DD, you buy like DDT. But anyway, it was bad stuff, but that didn't do it. We thought it was, and it didn't do it. So for the next 10 years, we sold something for brown patch fungus and called Dacanel. And we sold tons of Dacanel, and that didn't do it. Uh, we kept having die back. We would say it was a seven year grass. After five or seven years, it just started dying out on you. Well, finally, I don't know which university but I've told you all about this, but all the agricultural universities in the Southeast compare notes so they don't duplicate, which is very good. And then they share so that they don't have to do it themselves. And one of the universities, I think it was North Carolina State, but I'm not sure, they found that centipede, we used to call it the lazy man's grass because you didn't have to mow it much because it doesn't grow very tall. Um, but, what we found out is that if you don't mow it very often, like every two weeks or so, it still looks pretty good. But it will grow on top of itself, and then it'll form this mat under it, and it's kind of sitting up on it, and you walk on it, and it's so plush and nice, and then next spring you have these big dead areas. What it is is it's not laying on the ground, the ground is laying off the ground when the cold gets under it, kills it and we had big dead spots. And that was it the whole time, we just didn't realize it. So it's what we, they told us is to mow it weekly, whether you want to or not, and mow it extremely low. Um, you know how you never want to say, my mother-in-law taught me something? <laughs> she would buy this little $99 lawnmower. She would pay over $99 for it and lower the wheels as low as it would go and drag that thing behind her and that son of Eve was gorgeous. It just thrived. Never had a dead area in it because she kept it mowed low and off. And, uh, and that worked. And if you never fertilized son of Eve, it'd probably still be fine. But um, so that's one of the rules. Two, two rules for son of Eve, mow it very low and at least weekly and you'll, you'll probably have a good yard. Okay, St. Augustine, y'all, us South Carolinians call it Charleston grass. <laughs> Charleston grass. Um, and it's the same as St. Augustine. Of course, there are several varieties of it. But the thing about St. Augustine, we're having a problem now, and it's called take all. And it takes all. And you can spray it, to suppress the problem, but you cannot kill the problem. So once you get it, you're gonna have it. I had one lady over in Augusta, can't believe she's not here because she comes all the time. But anyway, she tried everything and she tried all the natural things too. And I really thought she was gonna get on top of it. Um, peat moss is, is a sphagnum moss, which makes peat moss is a um, natural, natural, a natural fungicide. Um, and she would get guys out there with peat moss and rubbing it together and spreading it all out. We thought she had it, but she didn't. 
Um, another, another pharmacist at Aiken, he, uh, he'd heard that corn gluten would work. So he got, uh, he said he got a 50 pound bag of, um, of uh, hush puppy beans. <laughs> and, and he put it out on his yard and he said, I look like one great big hush puppy when I do it. And, uh, but he said it, 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 it did help and slowed it down. But take on is a problem. So if you don't have St. Augustine, don't go after it. Now they say they're coming out with a resistant strain, but I would let time tell before that. I would go with a different grass. Um, but Zorgia, there's, like I said, there's several Zorgias, and Zorgia is my favorite. Um, you still need to probably mow it weekly and low. People let grasses get up to that. And here's the problem. The Gus Chronicle used to be terrible about this. They would take a article for Michigan State and print it down here, and it would be totally unrelated to us. It would say, we're mowing our lawns too low, you know, and need to mow them three to four inches high and all this stuff. Of course, they're talking about fescue and block grind, bluegrass, stuff like that, which doesn't have anything to do with it, but people don't realize that. So make sure you go with suggestion from University of Georgia Clemson. By the way, let's see if she was able to do that. Um, right at the bottom of the sheet, it says Clemson Home and Garden Information Center. Um, Y'all need to look that up. That is very informative. Y'all will be talking on trees here in a minute. And the, the big thing is it was going through all the different oaks and that that new, they post something every week and um, they were going through all the different oak trees. So that was very helpful. And, and it's just got, you can actually look up stuff and find problems on that. University of Georgia has one too. Um, I'm partial to Clemson for some reason, but okay. Um, trees. Dogwood, y'all. Now, this is definitely not a complete list. This is just some suggestions that we're gonna go through. If y'all have questions on uh, different ones, let me know. Dogwoods, y'all, our native dogwood is in sad shape. And it doesn't look like it's gonna improve. Um, when we were 50 years ago, when we first started the nursery, uh, we didn't know about powdery mildew on dogwoods. Powdered mildew looks like a powdered mildew or not, but it looks like a kind of a powdery on the on the leaf. And um, that was not affecting dogwoods. Well, it used to be what we call a tropical disease. It would come out of Miami and Homestead, Florida, and then it'd make it up here about midsummer a little bit, and it would affect a few things. Then the cold would kill it and go back down. So now it's coal resistant and it's staying up here and it's affecting our trees. Dogwood is one that's definitely affected. Hydrangeas are, a lot of things are affected by it. But dogwoods are just succumbing to it all and it's one of my very, very favorite landscape trees. Um, but there are some hybrids that work pretty good. But let me just tell you, if you want regular dogwood, um, I don't even know if Chad knows that, and I'm sure they probably do. But uh, do not plant it in full sun. It is an understory tree. And here's what will surprise you, is that it's the trunk on the tree that gets damaged. Okay, you know, we, we want a dog over a great tree and, you know, branch it up here. Well, when the sun hits that trunk, it blisters the bark, and it kills the tree, but you don't see it for four or five years. You can't tell it's blistered. And then uh, then it gradually de just declines and you can't tell why. Well, if we leave the branches low to the ground, it shades itself and it helps. But just don't put it in full sun. Now you'll say, well, the prettiest dogwood I've ever seen is in full sun, and that's probably true. But you'll look at it, it's probably 15 feet high and 25 feet wide because it's shading its bark. And so 
be aware of that. Um, dogwoods do not like much at all planted around them. They're extremely sensitive to Roundup. Um, so don't put any Roundup around them. Um, and we just had to learn that. But, you know, I still, it's still one of my favorite trees. But um, it does get not only powdery mildew, it gets anthracnose, which is another leaf spot. Um, and then it succumbs to that sun skull on the bark. And uh, it's, it's just a weak tree. And we try to force it in the full sun and it doesn't like it. But you put it in uh, the shade and it'll do fairly good. Um, but you just got to be careful and you might have to spray it. So just be aware of all that. Um, then, yes, ma'am. Um, probably uh, there's this stuff over there called F stop. F stop will take care of several problems. It'll take care of the powder building and it'll take care of the track much too, I believe. And it's in a right underneath. Oh, all over. And see that's hard to do, but it's in a um in other words, it has the applicator already on it, you just put it to a hose. And that and start as soon as you see leaves coming out. And um spread a couple every couple of weeks. Yes, ma'am. Instead of using the stakes, use this stuff they're carrying. Um, I'll fertilize them. Uh -huh. The 21 49 is much better than the stakes. Okay. Got more, um, got all your minor relevance in it, the stakes done, and it won't burn. Okay. And you just put it right on top of the hole. What was that kind of? It's called 21 49 or super slow. Okay. They sell it in 50 pound bags. Do we have a bag up here? No, I think they moved. Okay. Well, We'll show it to you, okay. but you will love it. We literally use it for everything in the yard, um, including the grass. Okay. It lasts one year, okay. 12 months. Um, how often you have to put it out? One what, what time. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Okay. It's such a good fertilizer. What it is is our commercial fertilizer that we use in the field, um, in containers. Uh, you don't want to have to go out every month or two and put a teaspoon of fertilizer in a, in a million cans. So they came up with this. Osmocote did first, but Osmocote did not last at all. This is so much better than Osmocote. It's got all your minor elements or your trace elements, we call it. It's just wonderful just stuff. Put it down once a year. Throw it under there, make it easy. Wow. What month? Um, actually, any time, but now it's real good. This is probably the idea. But um, it is the best rose food you'll ever find, the best azalea food you'll ever find, the best lawn food you'll ever find. And I've got testimonies in here. A lot of people in here will testify to that. Okay. It's an incredible problem. And we do suggest you lime too. In other words, lime is, is as important as fertilizer. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's called F stop. F S D O P. Yes, F for front, yes. Stop. S D O P. They've got it over there. Um, but it's a very good product. It can be used on vegetables too, so it's, I don't want to say harmless, it's not, but um, it's one of the better um, products. Um, okay, some of the hybrid dogwoods are very, very good, very resistant. Yes, sir. I, I'm, I'm not carrying you at all, I'm sorry. Now, thank you. <laughs> One of my faithfuls here, do not fertilize your lawn until May. No matter what what your um, lawn and 
long guy does, do not fertilize until May. Um, this is a wonderful product, um, and it's it's one of the more gentle products, and it's a fungicide, but it's good on roses, vegetables, tomatoes, things like that. But read your labels, y'all. Don't just we didn't really do that. Read your labels. Uh, yes, sir. Going back to your graph of the soy show, you have to use a read a lot more on that thing. They suggest on animals that you do use a real mower, right? But uh, if you mow it with a sharp mower and and if it's a really turning fast, okay. you can do it with a regular mower. I know my sister, my sister has that, and she does with a regular mower, and it works pretty good. And the guy that cuts for it does it too with a regular mower. Um, okay, but some of the hybrid dogwoods are really nice. Um, there's one in particular that's an evergreen dogwood called Empress of China, and um, it it's evergreen. You know that's weird, but it does bloom different because the flowers come up with the leaves, and it's not the traditional, but it's still pretty. It's wonderful. Um, okay, oak trees. Um, that's a huge subject, and by the way, that Clemson, uh, Clemson Home and Garden Information Center, they went through all of, a lot of the oaks. But um, there are some oaks that really do grow pretty fast. Um, you get the live oak, of course, it's going to be slow as Christmas, but, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful. And Aiken is a, um, a wonderful example of that with the... Um, what is that? South Boundary? Oh, South Boundary is well. But um, so picking out a tree, you know, the right tree. Some of the pin oaks, the Schumard, and let's see what I hear. Not all Schumard. Um, those are in the kind of pin oak family where the pointed on the leaves, you know. Um, and they make a good tree and they grow fast. Um, they're talking about 18.4 inches a year, so that's not that slow. Um, you know, I, I, when you've been in the business for 50 years, it's funny. Uh, downtown North Augusta, the Security Federal, there's an oak tree down there about that big around, and I planted that thing. <laughs> you know, I'm going, not really. I'm, I'm definitely old when I see that tree. I said, I said that's incredible. But uh, they do grow, you know. And an oak tree is a nice tree. Um, and when you say live oak, people don't think it ever drops leaves. Don't tell me it doesn't drop leaves. If you've got a live oak, you know it does. But, um, but it doesn't lose them all. I planted a tree, a guy called me one day. He said, Gerald, you remember that big live oak in my front yard? He said, well, the storm blew it over. He said, I need to replace it because he said there's a a street light that blinks and he said it comes in my sunroom and in my office and he said I gotta have a tree. And I said okay I get you. Probably the biggest thing I get you is a six inch tree you know which is a big tree you know and he said girl I'm 83 years old I need a tree. <laughs> and I said well you're talking to the wrong person. Finally he convinced me that I did. So I, I got him a 10 inch tree it was 30 feet tall, and to get a crane in there and everything, uh, and they had to stop traffic, had to get a pay a policeman and all this stuff. I, I went through it, buddy. But I told him before, I, I had it all figured. I said, are you sitting down? And he said, yeah, why? I said, because this is it. We're not negotiate price, this is it. And I told him, and he said, he got real quiet for about 30 seconds, and he said, Let's do it. I was going, oh no. <laughs> but we planted that thing and it turned out gorgeous. He was very pleased with it. We, but like I said, we had to get a crane to get over all the wires. We, he got that tree, it weighed um, 8,000 pounds, I think. He put that tree 90 feet in the air to get it over it because it was 55 feet from the street, so you had to get it. That's a whole story about that. I can write a book on that one. But um, 
so picking out a tree is important. Now, there are a lot of trees that I didn't go through here all of them. Let's go through the maples. Uh, Japanese maple is probably one of my favorite things in the world. Um, and every yard has to have at least one. We have a lady that works for us, and y'all, her yard is probably 60 feet high and 100 feet deep. And she's got 75 Japanese maples in her yard. Wow. And it looks good. It looks good, I have to say. Uh, Mary, I don't know if y'all remember Mary that worked for us. It's hers. And, um, but you can't have too many. <laughs> that may be pushing it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, picking out the right one, they will take full sun, but they don't like it to start with. You got to keep them hydrated, y'all. I don't. I, don't, I need to <laughs> emphasize that every one of these to plant everything shallow. You cannot plant it too shallow. You can take it and take it out of the can and sit it on top of the ground without ever digging a hole, and it'll do just fine. Don't you keep it working. They go root down and you'll be fine. But you can plant it too deep and kill it in a skinny minute. Um, and it doesn't take but that much too deep to either stun it or kill it. And everything needs to be planted shallow. Shiver, my son that works here, he's got a saying, he says, plant it too low, it will not grow. Plant it too high, it will not die. So you you plant it shallow. Everything you plant is shallow. You know, after the 50 years of trying to come up with easy ways to make people make things live, I came up with two rules. Number one, plant it high. Whatever you do, plant it high. Leave the top showing one, two, three inches up. And for the tree, you want it up five, four, six inches. And then water. That's it. Two things. And you, you're going to make it live if you do these two things. You give it enough water, in other words, I look at a can, if it's a three gallon can, I said it needs a gallon of water every day for eight weeks. Of course, this time of year it doesn't need that, but in the summertime and spring, I get a third of the container size in water every day. In other words, if you give it two gallons of water, you're going to drown it if it's sitting in plain. You give it a half gallon, that's not enough. Give it a gallon. In other words, you got to think like a tree, think like a plant. And so you need to make sure you don't overwater or underwater. That's why we tell you how much to use. Um, so do things you got to get it grow. Now you can fertilize it. You can put soil, different soils in there, compost and things like that. But that's not going to make it live. Making it live is planting shallow and water, the proper amount of water every day. Well, not every day. Okay. Just for when you just plant it or its whole life? No, that's a gallon of water for like the rest of that summer. Like if you plant it in April, and it's going to be hot by then, it needs a gallon a day in a, from a three gallon can, a gallon a day every day the rest of that summer. And if it rains, that's, you don't have to give it that gallon, but it's not going to hurt you if you do. But see, if you give it two gallons, and it's in play, you go around it. So you've got to know what you're doing. And you know, when I say a gallon, that is a rule of the thumb. you got to think about it and see if that's going to do it. Um, sometimes that's too much. Like a Japanese maple, if it's in a three gallon can and I gave it a gallon a day, that's too much. So you got to kind of weigh it out. Um, some things are going, you know, like azaleas and boxwoods and hollies and things, that's kind of a rule of the thumb for those things. When you come to specialty things, you may need to cut back some. Um, yes, sir. Right. Well, landscaping backyard with trees, and we have a septic tank. How aware do you need to be of the drain field and root and fruit? From what the second tank guys tell me, you do not have to be aware of where it is. Don't worry about it. And I'm going to tell you why I think they're right. My septic tank line snakes between. 100 foot pine trees and maples and all, just all around through that. It's been there 35 years, well, 37 years now. Um, and the trees actually drink the water and they don't stop it up. 
Uh, what we used to think, well, they stop at us. But no, they actually drink the water. And they love it. It's the kind they like. Um, so don't be so careful now where the tank is. You don't want to plant on top of the tank. Obviously not. And um, you don't want to hit a line and dig into a line. But you don't have to be that careful. Now, if it bothers yours, don't come to me. <laughs> Everybody is unique. You know, people call me, see, is that tree going to fall? It has a scar on the side and all this. I said, well, I said, if you're mine, I'd leave it. But if it falls, don't call me. <laughs> I'm it's everything so different and storms are different and everything. Okay, the um, Japanese evergreen oak is a neat tree. You, they may not have any, but it is a it's really a neat tree. Um, it's kind of different. Um, it, it doesn't look like an oak, but it's got big leaves like this. It is really, really pretty. Um, and it's kind of rare. Um, okay, maples. Uh, well, I think I, I, I was going to be down in maples. Uh, <laughs> well, there are literally hundreds of different varieties of Japanese maples. I mean, literally. Uh, Ryan, how many do you have? Uh, in my personal collection, yes. I, I found 120. See? <laughs> down at the nursery, we probably got 30. Right, right, right. I've got a, a guy over at Westlake, and he's got 137 different varieties of Japanese maple. They're, they're addictive. This, this yeah, they are. They're are addictive. Uh, so, you know, the sky's the limit there. Um, Tiny maple, don't know a lot about it, but it would be a small uh, shade tree. And, um, all right, let me go into days. This is, this is, a tough, I mean, a hard subject. To... Native, if you will look at native Japanese, native maple, red maples, in parking lots around town, 80% of them are hurting. They're damaged, they have problems, they're, they're dying. And uh, I looked at the tree you see there's this scale insect on them that's killing them. And um, so I talked to Dr. Dr. Chung at Clemson. He told me what we could do about it. But finally, it's what I realized. I mean, there was these trees over at Augusta on them that were like eight, 10 inches, and we were injecting them with this chemical and all to kill the scale on them. And then in five years, it was right back on them again. Bartlett tree, that's right in it, Bartlett tree. They have a research center up in Charlotte. It's like 600 acres. And they just research everything about trees and everything. You know what they figured out? Our native Japanese maple is girdling itself underground. Let me tell you why that happens, okay. Uh, and so when it girdles itself, when it stresses these insects, that scale that I thought was the problem is secondary. These insects come in and attack this tree because it's suffering. Uh, it, a tree puts out kind of like pheromones, not really pheromones, I don't care what you call it, but it's definitely gas is what it is. And it draws these scale insects and things like that. Well, why are they girdling underground? They don't do that in the wild. Every tree grew up in a container. In a gallon can, then we moved it to a three gallon can, then we planted it in the field. The fruits. Now why? This one is so much more susceptible than anything else, but it is. Uh, a Japanese, I mean a regular red maple. And so it chokes itself underground. Now the tree grows, and it'll get this big, but eventually it'll get it. Now it doesn't get every one of them, 
because I've seen trees within 15, 20 feet of each other. One's totally ate up with the scale, and the other one's totally fine. Um, but it's, what we started doing uh, at the nursery is we get them in in 15 gallons, you know, big can like this, eight, 10 foot tree. We take them out of the can, that's the man right there, she for people to do it. Take them out of the can, sit them on top of the ground, take a sawzall, and cut them in three ways. Cut that root system. And that's really tough on a tree, especially if it's kind of root bound. But we put it back in the can, it will recover real quickly, and you'll never have that problem because we prevented the trees from girdling themselves. And it worked like a charm. Uh, so that's something if you consider a ma maple. Now listen, some of these maples, like October Glory, Summer Sunset, Brandywine, all those trees are gorgeous trees. But if you don't do this, at least 70, 80% of them are going to curl underground. ground. So be careful. I love them. It's one of my, because it's a native tree. Yes, ma'am. I would probably take the saws off and leave it in the ground. And, um, and, and with the longest blade as you can find, come away from it. And hopefully you're going to get the girl. Um, you don't know that you will, but that would be the best thing. If you see it already suffering, all right, what I see a lot of times is the scale on it, and you can't see it good because uh, I'm a trained eye to know what it looks like, because it looks like a bark with just little tiny pimples on it. But um, sometimes when the bark is already coming off, it's too late. If the bark's not coming off, I will try it. I wish we had a chainsaw with a <laughs> blade about that long, but that would definitely build a chainsaw. I'm going to get one one day with carbide blades and do that. <laughs> they have chainsaws to cut concrete now, so we... Uh, but, uh, but that's the story on, the, on our native maples uh, is, is that's a problem. So um, uh, when you buy one, you want to go ahead and cut it. Okay, and it's still, it's still, y'all, it's one of our, our best um, ornamental trees. It's not the best shade tree in the world because they, they're kind of a little bit hairy, but it's just a beautiful tree. And the fall colors is stunning. All right, sugar maple does not seem to have a problem. Uh, I would probably still cut it, but it probably doesn't, it doesn't girdle itself. It's just the red maple. And red maple, y'all, is a, is a misnomer because it's not red uh, in, in the summer. If you look right now, go out through the woods in the swamps, you'll see little red flowers deep dark maroon flowers right now. They're coming right now. That's why it's called red maple. Not because of the red leaves. Because it might not turn red in the fall. It is never allowed to be red in the summer. Um, no, there is one maple called, called Scarlet King. And you'll see it in all the catalogs. And this gorgeous red, red maple all the time. Don't bring it down south, it's not going to do well. I've seen one or two that have struggled to live, but it's probably not going to make it. I mean, it'll make it, but it's not going to be like it would be in, in Maine or, or New Hampshire or something. That's where it grows fine. It doesn't grow good here. It's called Scarlet King, and there are a lot of varieties of it, but don't try to bring it south. There's a lot of things you don't want to try to bring south that you want to, but you see in the books, but don't try to do that. Uh, the sugar maple, though, is, is good. It's slower than the red, but it has a great amber fall color. Um, the red maple, y'all, have a variety of colors. October Glory is probably one of the most stunning because it is October. It is glows it's in the dark almost. It's so red. Um, but one of my favorite trees is the southern sugar maple. Where is she from? There he is. Uh, she what's Asa Barbatum and Asa um, 
Lucaderm. What's Southern Shore? Lucaderm is the uh, chalk bar. Chalk bar. Okay. And then Acer Barbatum. I think that's the Southern Shore. Okay, Southern Shore is Acer Barbatum. But um, it looks like a Japanese maple in a way, kind of a little bit larger. You know, in other words, not a straight trunk and a branch out like our maple. But I love that tree. You will see it along the Savannah River Bluffs, where you one in your backyard, the beautiful, um, and the Savannah River Bluffs, and um, and but it is a native tree and it is very good, um, and so that's a thought. And that's hard to find. I don't know if you can find it with any size. You can find small ones, but it's even hard to find those. Um, but that's a special, special tree. Weeping willows. How many have tried weeping willows? How many have lived? I call it a five to ten year tree. And let me tell you why. It gets a disease called fusarium down here. And it's going to kill it in five to ten years. It is rare you see one over ten years old. Now in ten years it'll be it'll be 40, 50 feet high. But um, you're probably going to lose it. Because it gets fusarium in the soil. Uh, cotton was planted so extensively that it inoculated the soil with, with diseases and things like that. And that's one of them. And it will, it will get weeping willow. Of course, screw willow is the same way. Uh, so if you want to plant one, plant it, but just don't plant on it living forever. Uh, and it's a good tree, but it, it, it is going to, you can't plant on it living. Uh, red bugs, oh man, I love red bugs. But people try to put them in full sun, they don't like it. Um, and there are a lot of good varieties out there now. And you just need to look up some, but probably don't put them in full sun. I did see one. Um, Shiver, what's that one called? Um, Sunrise, what is it? Uh, I think sun. No, it was Tokyo Sunrise or something like that. Okay, Rising Sun, maybe Rising Sun. Now that one took more sun. It's got kind of um, yellowish amber leaves. It's pretty, and I saw it taking a fair amount of sun. There's the weeping red bud that's beautiful, but try not to force them into full sun. Um, crab apples, just do not perform here. It's too hot for them. They don't perform good. Um, flowering pears. You know that one. Next year it is outlawed. In other words, you cannot plant a Bradford pear um, in South Carolina after next year. I wouldn't plant one this year either. Because <laughs> that's a terrible freeze. Um, I don't know if y'all, you know, it's coming up from seed everywhere. I mean, you can find it in the woods. Exit 5 in North Augusta when you're coming from Columbia between the interstate and the, um, I bet there's, I said 500 in that one little, they come up from sea. And um, it's just, it's just like, and when they come up from sea, they have thorns about this long. And uh, they're, they're mean. So, and they get fusarium, I'm not fusarium, they get fire blood. Fire blight's terrible and starts killing them. And um, and then they have the little berry that stinks and yes. the flowers stink, you know. <laughs> and I think we're probably a lot of the fault because we sold so many back in the in the in the uh, 70s and 80s. But I don't plan a rabbit pepper. Um ma'am, you don't like red pearls? No, because they come up so much. Okay, well, they, a gray myrtle sprouts when you damage the root system. It won't sprout if you don't damage the root system. But if you try to plant under them or dig under them, they're going to sprout right there where you damage them. So if you can prevent, keep from that. Okay, gray myrtles. One of my favorite, favorite landscape trees, and I hesitate to even say this, but we got a problem. Gray myrtle scale. Um, be watching out for it. There is, 
is a solution. Not easy, but um, you can spray and help with it. Um, if you run into it, uh, maybe contact me and I'll try to talk you through it. Um, we thought, we, we, it was in Columbia for years, not years, you know, probably five years. And Dr. Chung and I were kind of monitoring it. And last year or year before, I think, two people came in with it in North Augusta. And this is not good, y'all. It's bad. It's a killer. Do you really? Where are you? They said in Augusta, 80 to 90% of the trees in Augusta have I haven't seen it that much, but I have seen it. Where are you, Augusta? You're like on the Oh, really? Okay. You're the older part. You're the old right girls. Yes, you. Yes, this bark scale, you'll see it on the bar. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. Well, it will turn black. The black it all comes from um, the scale secretes a sugary stuff called honeydew, and then the black grows on it. Um, gardenias do this too, but it's a different problem. Um, hackberry trees, I don't know if anybody's got a hackberry tree, but. Um, it has a problem too with aphids. Um, but Craig Burl, I still love them. It's, like, it's one of our few trees that do not get humongous. Been on the variety. If you plant natchez, it's going to get big. Um, when I say big, it'll get um, 30, 30 feet anyway. But it's a beautiful tree. Shapes up the ones on the summer. Um, natchez is one of the best. Because um, it will not, in the fall, it keeps its foliage pretty good and it'll have a beautiful fall color. Natchez is white, but it grows big. Um, I mean, it'll grow 30 feet, and it'll be 20 feet wide. It's just a gorgeous canopy. It bloom all summer. Um, but it's a good tree. But if you start seeing the problem, I tell you what, we Diseases going to be the, be the downfall of us. Gerald? Yes. I've got one that's, uh, I think it's a Natchez. It was there before I bought the house 28 years ago. And about a third of the trunk now is covered. Uh, is it really? Yeah. My exterminator, he said all the things you do. He's been studying, he took a class on it. Um, <coughs> and uh, he wants to take a shot and say, um, I can tell you I have. There's a product called Safari. Um, it's a systemic. You put it in the soil around the tree. It'll absorb it up and it'll get it. Yes. Okay. Um, and it's you have to order that probably online because we can't sell it. It's a well, he because of his license, he's able to get it. Tell it Safari is the way on the way to go. Okay. Yes. Is there a question about roots? I've got a uh, wall cypress. Roots coming up like she's talking about too. Um, on a freight world, when you damage the root, you go get it. That's it. You know, like you plant something under it, it's gonna scar the root, and they're gonna come up there. Ball cypress, <laughs> that's just the nature of the beast. <laughs> it's gonna have knees. Uh, they're coming up, y'all. What it is, like the cypress, and like um, they come up for air, and that's what. Ball Cypress is doing. And you know, we, 50 years ago, maybe one or two percent of our yards had an irrigation in. Now, 90 percent of our yards have irrigation in it. We work too much. We don't realize it, but we do. We want to keep the grass green, but the trees going, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. So they're trying to breathe. A lady called me. She said, Mr. Stevens, I've got 10 loads of uh, topsoil coming today to cover up roots on my tree. My tree roots keep coming to cover the ground. And I said, no, 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 don't you dare. I said, you're going to carry your tree. She said, well, the roots keep coming. I said, yeah, they're trying to get air. and You're trying to, you're trying to cover them up. And you're, you're watering too much, all this stuff. So um, tree roots need air. That's why I say don't plant grass under. And grass doesn't want to be under. 
and trees don't want grass under them, so don't plant grass under them. Um, mulch it good with a breathable mulch, you know, pine straw leaves or something like that. And you can use the, the bark mulches, but you don't want to get so heavy with it because it can't breathe through it. They need to breathe. Um, that's, what they're, they're, that's why they sent out all these lateral roots, so they get air, not water. I mean, they do want water too, but you got to have both. Um, but let's just work with Craig Marble. We had a problem that scared us completely to death called sudden oak death syndrome. Um, and that scared the southeast. And now we realize it was already here and it had caused hardly any problems. Over the Craig Marble scales don't do that, but I doubt it. Yes, ma'am. Right. And one that's red, red. Is that just the variety? It's the varieties. Okay. They are just like kids. They're going to, every one of them going to be different. Well, the variety will. Now, like Nancy is, you can kind of predict what it's going to do. But I don't like the reds and the pinks. It, it's going to be different. Then, you know, also, help me out when they get so heavy, they, they have to mm -hmm. really, really low. Should you, like, stick them up somehow or wrap them up? Just let it be that way? Or should you? I kind of let it be that way. It's what I did. We had a crank curl called a Deer East. And that thing does not want to grow up at all. Um, it wants to spread out almost as the ground cover, but it'll be, we finally got ours to be about 15 feet tall. But what I did with that is I didn't brace it at all. And every time I see a limb that was too low, I'd try to clip it. And I would try to just do that so it would be naturally supported by itself. But then it would, uh, you just kind of play with it. Yes, sir. Excuse me? Bungee you can, but if I try to even get by without bungee cords. But it's it's the it's the nature of that tree that's gonna do like that. Excuse me? Right. Okay, y'all um you know what Craig Myrtle Burger is? Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't know what Craig Myrtle Burger is? Okay, you know when these mow and blow guys that don't know what they're doing and they need something to do in the wintertime, they come through and just cut your crape myrtles down to stubs, that's, that's crape myrtle work. When we cut them down where they just big old sawed off with, with a chainsaw, that's crape myrtle work. And that will, let me ask you something, you had the crape myrtle would yours have a crack mark murder? Okay. Because that does encourage it. But Craig. now that they're dead above the knob, and he's told me now to cut them to the knob. I don't mean that's fine, but I mean, are they the ones that have the scale on? Yeah. See, crack mark murder encourages that. Um, it doesn't necessarily cause it, but see, it weakens the tree so that that can attack it. So this thing you think, they think they're smart, but they're dumb. And cutting your trees back, that is not good. And that will actually encourage the problem we're talking about with the schedule. Um, okay, I'm about to wear my work about What's the best thing you need to have when they'll do the great That F-stop? F-stop. Yes, ma'am. Just get it every year. Yep, yeah, you will. If certain varieties are very susceptible to it, and I'm gonna get it. Yeah. Um, Just some, spray it all over. Yes. It it start good. early, and this will definitely help. Um, if you get tired of that, take the tree out and get one that does not have a problem. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes you, you know, we've got varieties now. Like Natchez hardly. I don't think we've ever seen powder building on the Natchez 
There are certain peak and red ones that won't get a deer, but it's hard to find. It'll get rid of it, yes. But um, but it'll be back next year. It's not going. They can be cold tender, I know that. What? But cold tender? Yes. But, I, um, but they usually make our olives pretty good for what I understand. Until the birds eat them all. What's that? Until the birds eat them all. Oh, different. <laughs> okay. All right, I need to move quickly here. We've already overstayed my welcome. Uh, color. I, when I do landscape design, I love color in the yard. Now, um, I like what we call, I call permanent color, but uh, if you do annual color, um, don't bite off so much that you overwhelm yourself every spring and every fall. In other words, pots are great for that. Uh, my wife does great with pots, and um, that gives you some annual color, you know, begonias and whatever in the spring and then pansies and whatever in the fall. Um, but when you pick out huge areas and try to, if you like doing it, that's fine. I mean, it's a lot of work. Let me give you what, you know, these mowing bluff guys? When I'm talking to some, believe it or not. He was, he was um, planting car for like a shopping center and you know, they need a, a good bit. He'd go get truck loads of, of good potting soil and he just dumped it on top of the ground and planted his plants in that. Y'all, that is one of the best things in the world to do. Here's why. Now be careful, don't do it. I had one person do it under another Japanese maple and like to kill it because they exploded the roof. But when you pile it in a pile and plant on top of it, you cover up all the problems. You cover up all the weed seed, you cover up all the disease, and you got it right there. Um, and this takes a little more water, but so what? If it's going to make them look pretty and they're raised a little bit, make it enough so you don't have to dig through it to plant it. Um, in other words, leave it up a little bit. And uh, it's wonderful. It works great. And he was trying, he was being lazy about it. I'll be lazy. <laughs> okay. A perennial, now listen. We can spend weeks on perennials. Um, I am not a perennial expert. I know a lot about them, but let me let me give you a few hints. Perennials are not normally color all summer. They are color for two, three, four weeks at a time. I have one landscaper. And he wanted to plant perennial call for these housing developments um, so that he wouldn't have to do it and it would save them money the next year so they wouldn't have to do it. They were so disappointed because they saw very little color. Perennials are more of a hobby and something people love to get into. Let me tell you, it's really neat because there's, uh, I had two ladies at the nursery, probably two of the best perennial people in the Southeast. Mary and Peggy, and they knew perennials, and they can tell you what does red. You know, it's just fun to get into it. It really is. It's probably not a front yard thing. It's probably more, I mean, you can do it in a front yard, but do it in an area. Uh, but it's more of a backyard thing that you can really play. Uh, and it's fun to get into. you got to read about them, study about them, figure out. And you have, there's a lot of trial and error. You try them out and lose some, but you try them out and they do great. Then you know this one's a biennial. You gotta move it around and all. I mean, you know, it's fun. But don't plant perennials thinking you're getting by on something cheap. You don't have to do it every year. It's gonna be very disappointing. And you're not gonna get a lot of cold. Um, it is colorful when it's blooming, but it doesn't bloom all summer like annuals. Annuals usually bloom all summer. Now something like lantana, that's the native easy man's annual and parade. That's a good one. Uh, and what's that? Salvias. Salvias, yeah. 
But see, salvia is, depending on the salvia, they are not real sugar. You know, like Garanatica and Greggy and things like that. Um, but the regular salvia is, they're very cold, but they are in. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know much about the salvia. Mine are coming back already again this year, like the fourth year in a row. You need to share your knowledge there. Um, okay, uh, but but perennial is a whole different ballpark. It's fun to get into, but don't plan it for a lot of big splash of color that you don't have to, and you can be lazy about. You don't have to plan it every year. It's not that. It's something you want to really get into is fun, yes ma'am. And when you were talking about the um, potting soil on top, mm -hmm. you, that's mostly for annuals. You wouldn't necessarily... It is for annuals. It will work for perennials if you... Yeah, it will work for perennials okay. too, as long as you keep it hydrated. Y'all, you know, I'm a huge believer in drip irrigation. Love drip irrigation. If we get a chance, we may give a seminar on that. Um, because it's just, it puts water where you need it without wet and everything so bad. Okay, permanent coat. This is, I'm a landscape designer, and this is where I really like to, what I like to do, permanent coat. All right, we know as I is, um, there's hundreds of varieties. I'm real big into Encore as I is, which is a repeater. And I wouldn't sell them for the longest because I thought they would, they'd come a double price of a regular thing. And I said, well, you know, is it worth it? And yes, it is worth it. Um, they are not necessarily hardier than a regular thing, but they are good. But they do repeat. They repeat good in the spring and the fall, and they'll bloom a little bit off and on through the summer. And there's 30 something different varieties, so you've got a lot of choice in height and color and uh, foliage and all. So, all right, I designed a bed and I should have hung it somewhere over here for y'all. I call it a four season bed. I use it in almost every yard I plant. Um, it's a bed that is kind of a, it's kind of a stretched out S in the side of the yard or in the back of the yard. And it's what I do is I, I take Encore Zayas and I like to use the large ones, the four or five footers, three or four footers. And I put like 10 of them in a stretched out S, about five feet apart. Then behind that, I go with Camellias and Sasantos about every six, eight feet. Um, and then in front of that, I use hydrangeas. And if you got a deer problem, we'll switch to gardenia, but the hydrangea is, is by far my favorite. Okay, you've got this bed that's stretched out like 30, 40 feet. Behind it, you've got the bees that get, get heights on them. It's a sample. Okay, see the azalea is your spring flower and your fall flower, if you use on course. They'll give you some color in the summer. Then you got this hydrangeas that are going to give you color um, in the summer for not a long time, but you can use the full sun hydrangeas, which are like the limelights, and they've got little lime down, which performs really good and doesn't get so, you know, limelight will get up like this, but if little lime will get in the uh, three to four foot range. Um, but see, that'll give you your summer color, and then your fall color is your sample, which is a fall one camellia. And then you got your camellias that are your winter spring blooms. So in that bed, you've got four seasons of color. And you got, and it's, it doesn't look like a hedge, because you got it kind of curved a little bit. And um, it's so useful. In other words, I like, when I do a yard, you know, I do my golf course green grass, so it doesn't run up to the neighbor's yard. So I like a border kind of between me and them, and that gives you that real good, and you can do 
Come on, let's sort of shade your end. We can, you can bury it up. Um, but that makes a, you can do the borders with something like that. If you use drip irrigation, you can, camellias will take full sun if you use drip irrigation. Now, they eventually will take it even without drip. Um, but keeping them hydrated, that they'll take it. And you know, I, I always say, Southerners, you are crazy not to have a yard full of camellias and sustainables. What, look, look right now, all this color out here. Uh, and some Yankee. You <laughs> <laughs> say that. Instead, I can't stand all those blooms on the ground. I said, that is gorgeous. I love the blooms on the ground, you know. And um, so, uh, it's, I mean, to me, it's a magic. You know, it was, it'll be 20 degrees, and next week it'll be more like it normally does around here, and they'll be blooming. You know, they got hurt in 20 degrees, but then they got flowers left over. Well, Schumer, my son, he's got 70 some varieties of comedians planted between my house and his. And he's still playing. <laughs> he's still got them. Um, very proud of And I took my sister in law this week. She flew back to Detroit. And I said, I just want, before you go back, I want to show you some color that's right here, right now. And we walked up there through all those comedians. And she just, she said, can't take it big, you know. You're not going to get that in Detroit. Nope. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've had a disappointing experience with the same as I was planted in two weeks of shade. And the ones I planted in Detroit were the same as the ones I planted in Detroit were the same as the ones I planted in Detroit. They can. She said she planted some uh, Sasanquas, which is the problem. Sasanquas will take more sun easy. They'll take full sun easy. Um, but um, line them heavily and see if that doesn't help. A lot of times it will. But um, if you plant them in too much shade, and you can, you know, some of these oak trees and things like that, that's just pretty dense. Um, but uh, camellias, to me, are just wonderful. And hydrangeas, um, the deer absolutely love them. But it, they, I don't know what they've got for um, deer around here, but we used to sell liquid fence, and I'm sure they've got something. You got liquid fence? Yes. Liquid fence is wonderful, um, and if you got to keep it on, if you don't, they're going to get a mismatch. We've had very good luck with fallbacks. With what? Fallbacks, and fallbacks. you get it through Home Depot, you have to order it. Well, we don't want to get it through Home Depot. Well, I, don't I, don't know. Know. I know, but that, what he <laughs> needs to carry it he, he, he What's it called? Bob X. Bomb, B-O-M-B. B-O-B-B-E-X. Bob X. Bob X. Bob X, okay. That's the best one we've ever used. Really? It's really strong. Okay. Yeah, a study has been made by, I think, New Hampshire or Vermont. And next to an eight-foot fence, Bob X is number one compared to any other. Okay. Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're good. We and finally it's look into this. And it's 94% effective. Yeah, yes, ma'am. I have a question. And we love it. Bob uh, Evans. Um, oh, Laurel Lane by Lake Olmsted. Oh, yes, yes. And we're all lived on the I had, oh, on the side of my driveway, I had very old oak leaf They were beautiful. Every year they just got one year, and then another year, and another year. What was the last time to die? I don't know. I'll have to talk to you about that secret. I do not know that. Because that was horrible. Yeah, that would be. Normally they, they do good. Um, could age kill them? Some things age does kill them, but normally it's something besides yeah, age. I know these were probably 50, 60 years. Uh, it could be voles. Oh, moles. No. Voles. Like a little. I may know what a vole is. Oh, goodness. It's a little, you don't ever see him usually. That's probably what it is. He's a little mouse or actually he's a shrew with each roots. And he can be devastating. I bet you that's what it is. I bet you that's what it was too. Okay, uh, somebody asked me uh, how to get bowls. Because bowls love hosta. Ooh, they love roses. They'll eat the whole 
Rudolph of the Rose is Rose we fly. How do you get rid of that? Okay, I'm going to help you there. All right. I was speaking to the Lexington County Master Gardeners, and I said, I don't know how to get rid of it. And they said, well, that's the bowl point over there. I said, okay. So what she she couldn't grow anything in her yard like she wanted, like perennials, and they were all the bowls laid them off. What she did is she got like 18, 24 inches of corrugated black drain pipe without holes, now without holes. You get 18, 24 inches of that. She pull the straw back and the leaves back and lay it right there and cover it back over. And she keep putting rat bait in there. And um, now, where's my, who, who's, who was telling me about a good rat bait while ago? Um, but um, the surf rat baits, um, what, what were you using? Tomcat. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a unique way to do it. I'm going to just tell him by the way. I'll let you talk to him. But uh, keep it, you check on it every few days. And don't try to touch it because they can smell good. But check on it. Keep putting rat bait in it. And three months she had them all. Wow. And she couldn't grow anything in her real Hardly at all. Yes, sir. This is going to sound weird. And it doesn't kill them, but it will return. Yes. Cat turds, find where the tunnels are. Poke them down in the tunnels. What's that? Cat turds. Oh, cat turds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the cat, but it's <laughs> the cat poop. <laughs> and you, put, you put the cat poop down in the tunnels, and they think there's predators out there, and it drives them off. Right, right. But a cat is cat is very good too. Uh, a female fixed cat. Did you hear that? Not a male, he ain't worth a nickel. But a female cat, you get her fixed the day you get her, or you're going to have more than one cat for sure. Um, but a female fixed cat is one of the best things for most. But, um, but this rat bait thing works. It really does work. Um, okay, uh, some of the minor color, like spirea and forsythia plants, I burn. All those should be not used in your landscape as um, a major part of it because it's going to only look good for two or three weeks at a time. The rest of the time it's just going to be foliage or, or bare stems like the plants and all. Most of that is deciduous. Native Azalea is a wonderful um, Man, I'm kind of in the backdrop of the yard. They're just absolutely incredible. We call them when we grow it up pink, pink honeysuckle, but it's the native clay, it's what it is. Okay. Um, pruning, I mean, not pruning, um, edging. I like just to use a plant, no edging at all. Uh, I feel that you can get too busy with too many uh, structures or, or um, too much stuff in the yard. So I just use the edge of the grass and you cut a little kind of little trough on the outside of the grass so the mulch lays in it. And then you just edge your grass every time you mow. And if you use one of these um, weed eater style edgers, and not, not a weed eater because we did not dig it down. But if you use one of these weed ear style edges, you can do it real fast. Um, and if you do that every time you mow, it keeps it so crisp looking and nice and so defined. And that's what you want. Um, and then pruning, of course, is huge. Um, and that, that was our first class. Um, I hate weed barrier. And if you've had it for over two or three years, you will hate it too. Um, because we throw up on top of it just as bad. And then if you ever try to clean it out, you have got a huge mess. Uh, so I hate the stuff. I know y'all said it. 
but I won't, I won't buy it. <laughs> and people still want it. And it does have a, I think it's got a burger somewhere around it, but I've never met it. Um, one of the worst yards we, we landscaped, uh, they had, we buried down for like 10 years. It tripled the amount of time on trying to replant that yard. Not, not doubled it, but it tripled. And it was, my men were so mad at the end of that. <laughs> Any other questions, y'all? Uh, yes, ma'am. How do you keep the weeds out of your flower bed without having it? Good idea. Should have come to the class last week. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you can watch it online. Okay, let me tell you how to do it. Now, I'm a big proponent of Roundup. And I've gone to four classes by the universities. All four of them say it is not causing cancer. Whatever you believe these crazy ads tell you, don't worry about it. But they've got a roundup over here that is absolutely fantastic. It's the only one I use. It's called Quick Pro Roundup. It is a powder that mixes it in water, but it's got a quick kick that'll kill it a lot faster, three or four times faster than regular roundup. And it works better too. It kills, kills better. Um, in other words, I use a spray in a bed, kill all the weeds, and then I put a pre emergent down. If they've got the right pre emergence one over here. All right, let me tell y'all y'all see preen and all the Home Depots and Lowe's and everything preen. It is totally worthless to me, but there is a preen extended control that works. Don't get the regular preen, but preen extended control absolutely works. So look for that. And that, all right, it's what you're doing, ma'am, it's what you're doing is you're killing the weeds and then you put the pre emergent that keeps these seeds from coming up. Try to resist pulling weeds because when you do, you break the barrier that's made from the preen. Uh, see, the pre actually is a chemical barrier at the top that when the seed tries to sprout, they can't sprout in. They sprout and die as soon as they do. So, you're trying to um, kill all the weeds and then you put the um, pre down, pre extended control. Or there's another one over there that's a roundup one too, and it works too. Um, you can put it in the flower beds. Read on your label. Most of them you can, but you've got to read on your label to see what you can use it around, what you can't use it around. And a lot of times you just might pull it and do it anyway. But you do need to be. Quick question on that. Normally it won't, but look on your thing. If somebody asks. A lot of your herbicides signs will affect your pollinators too, though, so you got to be careful of that. Um, pollinators? Bees? Herbicides? That, that, some of them will affect the uh, Not much. Um, you have to have to be systemic up through it. No way it's not. Um, I mean, I listen. I'm, I was a beekeeper. I'm not even more, but I was a beekeeper. I'm very careful of bees, so I'm, yeah, I won't be sure of that. I, I like my own pollinator bees. I do too. I do too. Um, most of those are pretty safe. Roundup is hard to know safe around bees. I've never heard of a problem. Yes, sir. I don't know if you would be. I don't think you can. It's called a five fingers, ten fingers. <laughs> That's the only way I know how to prevent those. <laughs> yes, thank you. Just leave it on the all, all summer. Um, now, drip irrigation, you normally can just leave it and get it. 
when it comes to overhead irrigation, you just got to use common sense. And there's no rule of the thumb. Um, you know, I can't say half inch wheat, three quarters of an inch wheat. That doesn't work. Because um, you might have clay and you might have sand. It's using common sense. That's what it is. I got one more question. Yes, sir. Heck, you get rid of briars. Um, okay. Is it the briar with the root on it? It's got the, it's got the root balls that grows underground. Okay. All, all right, how to get rid of cat briars? Um, move. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me tell you how you can do it. You can do it. Round up, we'll do it. But let me tell you how you have to do it. You cut them off, and when they come back with that tender new growth, and it's still tender, frail round up, and normally that'll get it, but it might take two or three times. Okay. But that's better than trying to dig them up. Because yeah. you can't dig them up. Yeah. Are you talking talk about brambles? Oh, it's actually what we call cat briar or, or um, smiling plants. Brambles, you got to dig up. Yeah. Well, the roundup will do it. It will do smilex or cat briar. As long as you cut them off and let them come back fresh, that will. Now, if you've got blackberry, blackberry all is a total different story. Uh, Roundup normally won't do it. Um, the, the weed stump uh, killers, um, not even that, but weed be gone or something like that, we'll get, but it's going to damage things in your head. They, black hair is hard to get rid of. It's one of the hardest things. Yes, ma'am. Um, there are, now let me tell you, she's asking about rhododendron. Um, let me tell you how to plant a rhododendron. And if they get them in, normally they're going to be, they will do here. But they struggle. And the way to do it is dig a hole about this big and about that big, cover it back up and put it on top of the hole. You set it on the hole, you don't plant it in the ground. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> you don't have to dig the hole. If, if you dig the hole, yes, because you're going to soften it up. But you, you plant them literally on top of the ground. Okay, by the pot, pull some good. I mean, it's good topsoil up around it. <laughs> They'll do this time. But you did, you plant them in the ground, you're going to kill them. How many have killed rhododendron? <laughs> uh, but that, that works. No. It's <laughs> not, not easy to propagate. But you can uh, uh, just plant them shallow, very, very shallow, and keep the water good. But don't overdo it. Yes, please. If you take some sun, yes, we'll be Right. County? County. Do y'all have any county? You do? Great. County is native here. And it's going to be similar to Planet Shallow. Not maybe a shallow as a rhododendron. But it should thrive here. I've got wild ones growing in my woods all over. They're beautiful, but trying to dig one up, plant it, or even from a container, it's a little hard. But if you keep it, don't plant it deep. Plant it about halfway out of the way. County is one. And it's, this whole area is named for county. Uh, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Lionel, she's asking about lionel. There are there is one variety that will it's what it is, is we don't have enough coal. Yeah. And so Miss Kim Lilac will and there's probably one or two more. Yeah, no Miss Kim. Um, so that the uh, yes who yes ma'am. Well, if you do rejuvenation, 
Um, Y'all hear me? Five thing in forty five. Uh, you got to get it. Okay, we'll check with Chad. See. Okay, because that's in other words, if you do rejuvenate heavy pruning, um, as soon as you do that, you're going to create a problem called dieback, and you've got to spray it with this stuff. That thing in forty five. If you don't have it, you probably get it. Okay. So thing. I'm there for that. Um, I, you know, if they're working, I'm almost leave them. Line, yeah. line, line. I did that yesterday. Right okay. the right. yeah. Line them up again. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the second time already. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank y'all so very much. Thank you. Appreciate you, Mr. Gerald. And uh, next Saturday we're doing vegetables. Vegetables, yes. We're getting about time. Yeah, it is. That'll be good. We appreciate y'all coming. Hope you can make it back next Saturday. And y'all make yourselves at home, and we sure do appreciate you.